talk to you about my own sort of fear of my yeah. kids playing too much. Yeah. And a friend was like, try to think of it like he's, it's like a painting. Yeah. Like show it, ask him to show it to you. Like, yeah. like the same way you would treat a painting. Yeah. I want to see what you made. Yeah, that's right. So. Make it a family thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have kids? I have two daughters. Do they play? Yeah, they're older now, but they, not a lot. Because like growing up, I think it was always the thing that dad did. He's in charge of one of the top gaming consoles in the world. Microsoft Xbox, a $16 billion business, home to Minecraft, Halo, Sonic, and perhaps soon, Call of Duty. Get down! If a $70 billion deal to buy Activision goes through, the executive behind that deal is Phil Spencer. And if he has his way, he hopes the gaming industry will level up in the next 20 years and be less a battle between rival consoles and more home to platforms that reach every potential gamer on the planet. Joining me on this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Microsoft Gaming CEO, Phil Spencer. So we're gonna start by going in the Wayback Machine a little bit. Uh, did some research. You worked at a computer mart in Vancouver, Washington, where you were selling and playing a lot of computer games yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. I'm thinking like Stranger Things. Stranger Things resonates with my, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, growing up, my inner geekdom is there. I'm gonna need some photographic evidence of this. <laughs> what were your most played games in the 80s? Uh, so it's funny, when I started growing up playing video games, most of it was going to the arcades. Now most people won't remember these days of like going to a store where you'd put quarters and play. Uh, Robotron was one of my favorites in the arcades. I would go play that. And then probably more in the 70s and the 80s, I remember my dad bringing a video game, the Atari 2600 with the cartridges home. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of it. And I just kept playing and it's uh, still with me. You started out at Microsoft as an intern. I did. In 1988. <laughs> How would you compare Microsoft's history on games under Bill Gates versus Steve Ballmer versus Satya Nadella? Yeah, I think like many things at Microsoft back in the 80s, we started in video games as much out of, out of kind of a defensive. We were worried that other companies might be putting the home PC in place. And the avenue to get there was through video games and game consoles. So we said, okay, we're gonna go start our own game console because if anybody's gonna build a computer for the home, we wanted it to be Microsoft. Uh, I think through Steve's years, it was more about growing the business and how do we bring kind of business leadership into this group of ragtag people who are out there just having fun building video games as part of Xbox. I think with Satya, when I first took this job and I, I got this job as head of Xbox about two months after Satya Nadella became the CEO of Microsoft. Well, and when Satya started, there were activist investors targeting the company. You know, yeah. The stock hadn't been doing well. They were targeting Xbox. Absolutely, yeah. At the time, absolutely right, that there was a question of why are we in video games? In fact, one of his first questions to me was, because he had come from the cloud part of the business, being in the cloud, was he didn't actually understand why we were in video games. Not as a negative, just as literally, why, are, why is Microsoft this, at the time, what, $1 trillion market cap company? Why are we in the video game business? And he, he challenged us, like, let's go figure out why we're in the video game space and see if it makes sense. And if it does, let's be all in. And if it doesn't, we'd make other decisions. Early in that journey is when this game, which I know you know about, is Minecraft. And the opportunity to acquire Minecraft came about like months after this moment, so. I might have a kid or two that plays <laughs> Minecraft, yes. And it really caused us as a team to think about, okay, if you're gonna go spend two and a half billion dollars on this blocky Java-based game, how does this fit into the mission of this company? Let's talk about that strategy. Was the idea to tie gaming to the cloud, was that the clincher? If you think about a game like Minecraft or Fortnite or Roblox, these are games that play on iPads, they play on Xboxes, Playstations, PCs. The games were going from per device to per user and cloud would be an enabler for that. But we didn't start with how do we fit cloud into video games. We were just kind of watching the trends of creators and where they were building and saw this transformation of games being ubiquitous. How does this all, as you see it, connect to Microsoft's future? The cool thing I see going on now, and, and it, it does fit with the investments Microsoft's making in Azure and other places, 
is today the world, anybody's a creator. And video games are going through that same transformation where if I rewind to my childhood and playing video games, I walked into like an egghead software and there was a line of boxes. We might go create the best game in the world, but there was no way for us to get it in front of an actual person who might want to go play because we couldn't get shelf space, all these things. Today, we see gamers, on our creators on our platform from all over the globe who can create a game that can literally reach billions of people through our distribution capability. To a player, a game is a game. And you can deliver that game through the cloud to anybody who has a, a device that's capable of reaching the internet. I hear you're still an avid gamer. I am. How often do you play games? Like how many hours? I go to bed early, so I go to bed at 10. <laughs> it's Seattle at 10 o'clock. People who play with me online, they tease me about how militant I am at 10 o'clock. I'm out. Uh, I probably play 15 hours a week. As I understand it, you do your own deals. You don't necessarily need permission from Satya to do a deal, is that true? No, there's uh, <laughs> there's definitely, it, it depends on the amount of the money in the deal, but when we think about some of our bigger deals, we go to the board, um, and so Satya Nadella, Amy Hood, the CFO, have been incredibly supportive. As Xbox, we're one of the biggest consumer businesses in the company, we're a brand that makes Microsoft relevant to a whole generation that probably doesn't think about a lot of other Microsoft products in their day-to-day -day life. Activision specifically is facing a lot of challenges here. There have been lawsuits, there have been employee walkouts. How much did that concern you when you were thinking about this deal? Well, you're in the process of a, of a potentially monster deal, $70 billion acquisition of Activision. Talk to us about how this deal came together. When we were thinking about on that idea of what are we capable of doing today and where do we need to go. The biggest gaming platform on the planet is mobile phones. Uh, one and a half billion people play on mobile phones. And I guess regretfully as Microsoft, it's not a place where we have a native platform. As gaming coming from console and PC, we don't have a lot of creative capability that has built hit mobile games. One thing about the video game space is if you've been around maybe too long, you know most of the creators out there. So you kind of know teams that could be a good fit in terms of, of what we were trying to do. But we really started the discussions, internally at least, on Activision Blizzard around the capability they had on mobile and then PC with Blizzard. Those were the two things that were really driving our interest. Big tech is under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Big tech deals are under scrutiny. What's the status of the deal? What have your conversations with regulators been like? You know, I, I kind of come at this that big deals should be scrutinized, mm. right? I think that's the role of, of regulators, why they're in place. I feel good about the progress that we've been making, asking good, hard questions about, okay, what is our intent? What does this mean? If you play it out over five years, is this constricting a market? I feel good about it. Microsoft had its time in the antitrust spotlight. Mm. Now the spotlight's on Google and Meta and Apple and Amazon. How is it that Microsoft has skirted the spotlight? Your competitors might say it's unfair. Well, I, th I think your point about us having grown through that time, I might call that the adolescent years for us as we were kind of learning, uh, I think is an important consideration that uh, we did learn a lot as a company through that time and, and what it meant. And I think that sticks with us today. You've been a really big advocate of cross-platform play and this idea that gamers should be allowed to play whatever games they want on whatever platform they want. Why is that so important to you? Maybe you happen in your household to buy an Xbox and I buy a PlayStation and our kids want to play together and they can't because we bought the wrong piece of plastic to plug into our television. It just seems that these artificial constraints that the industry might put up for near-term kind of business dynamics in the long run, if you take a business that is at 3 billion people growing to 4 billion people over the next decade and saying, how do we continue to grow this business 
reducing friction for our customers has, as an industry has to be at the top. So how far does this go? Does this mean that Activision games, that Call of Duty, you'll be able to play on any platform in perpetuity? I don't know what that means in forever, like when you think about how long, and it's not for any kind of nefarious business reason, it's just like what do even platforms mean 10 years ago? Like I think the definition of some of these things might change over time, but our expectation is we want more people to play. So I know you're working with Sony on some things for the benefit of gamers. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? We have a pretty big publishing footprint on PlayStation as well as Nintendo, which means we have good relationships with those platforms because we're, they're a big part of our business and we're a big part of their business. I think our long-term ambition of where we see this industry growing is also shared. I think the area where things get stuck a little bit, it's in the kind of near midterm com competition. If somebody walks into a store, and they have one $500 bill. They're either gonna walk out with a Switch, which is what most people buy, or they're gonna walk out with a PlayStation 5, or they're gonna walk out with an Xbox, or maybe somebody will go buy a gaming, a Windows PC. Uh, but in that world of somebody's gotta make a decision for one platform over another in the beginning, uh, that is where I, I think we, we get stuck in some of the kind of near-term competition. I don't think that's bad, mm -hmm. right? It's just the dynamic of each of us pushing each other um, to build the best product for our customers. Now, while you've been working to make the gaming industry more collaborative, the gaming industry has historically been tough for women, for diverse voices. When you look back on Gamergate, do you think you did enough? I can always look back at any incident for me and think about things that in hindsight I should have done more, I should have done better. I'm proud of how our team evolves, how our leadership team evolves. Now, there's societal issues around us. The gaming industry is not kind of immune to those. People in my position sitting here as kind of old white guy as head of gaming platforms, not in, I'm, I'm more the norm than I should be. And I talk about three billion people who play video games. And if you say your, your audience is three billion people, then the demographic is the planet's demographic. I want our team to reflect the customer that we aspire to earn. I know that our teams ship their culture with every product that they ship. Well, Activision specifically is facing a lot of challenges here. There have been lawsuits, there have been employee walkouts, there have been accusations of sexual harassment, sexual assault. You know, how much did that concern you when you were thinking about this deal? We had access to data mm -hmm. from the company before we, we announced the acquisition to see what the actual numbers were in mm -hmm. terms of reports. Um, we definitely as a team signed up to say, just like we're on our own journey with Xbox, that we're gonna expand that journey if this deal closes. It's a lot of people and a lot of people that will feel very dedicated to and committed to, to building a great workplace environment for them. That's true of any of our studios, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it's obviously a conversation that you're gonna have. You think about the board of Microsoft and when they're thinking about the deal and they're typing into their search engine, Activision, what are the headlines that they're coming back? And there were questions that we had. We've learned from this, we will continue to learn. Um, and we're committed to that, that journey, not only for the betterment of our teams, but our customers, the creators on our platform. Uh, we think it's critical to our business success that we make progress here. Is Bobby Kotick gonna stay on? Yeah, I'm not in a position to make comments about their leadership team. We're in the regulatory phase and, and how that will close. Like, w when the deal closes, then we have say in how they're managed and how it goes. But until that point, I'm, I'm not really in a position to say. There have been very specific allegations of Bobby being aware of things uh, that happened and not reporting it to the board. What has he communicated to you about what he knew, what he didn't know? The discussions we've had were about the teams, where they're at, can they make the progress they need to make, because the closing is a long process. Are they putting in the work that they need to put in to? move along their journey, and I believe they're committed to that. When I look at the work that they're doing now, there's always more that can be done. Activision has divisions that are unionizing, and I know Microsoft has said they'll recognize those yeah. unions. What does that look like? I've never run an organization that has unions <laughs> in it, so I, but what I can say in working through this is we recognize workers' needs to feel safe and heard, and and compensated uh, fairly in order to do great work. So we thought it was important to make a public statement on that front.
for workers that are there that are making decisions about their employment and how they want to, you know, what that relationship looks like to understand what it would mean if Microsoft was able to close the deal. When I think about the environment on any of our teams. I build from a perspective of people, of building a workplace where people feel like they can do their best work in a sustainable way and they could see this as a long-term career for themselves. So if Xbox employees decided to unionize, would Microsoft support that? We knew when we made the public statement that it, was, it wasn't, that it would have a broader impact than just the impact at, at what would potentially happen on the close of Activision Blizzard. My view on, uh, on Metaverse is gamers have been in the Metaverse for 30 years. So let's talk about some of the broader trends. You and I talked a lot during the pandemic. Gameplay surge yep. during the pandemic. We were all stuck at home. Has that changed? It has changed. Uh, we've seen gameplay hours come down a bit, which I will say I think is a good thing. People should get outside. People should moderate. Long-term growth trajectory for the business is incredibly durable and strong. You have adults now that have grown up playing like myself, and it's become a more normal part of, of, of how people entertain and how families spend time. As the economy has has tightened for consumers, as gas prices are higher, people are worried about um, what, what their home economic situation looks like. We're seeing gameplay hours kind of stay strong because I think from a value perspective, gaming's a good value for people in a time of, of kind of economic constriction. If people bought Minecraft, they can continue to go play Minecraft. What about supply chain? What challenges are you still seeing are all the consoles that you want to have made in time for the holidays gonna be here? I still think demand will outstrip supply for us this holiday. We'll see when we get into 2023, you'll start to see more that supply is, is catching up with demand and maybe actually see one in the store when you walk in. And what's the future of the console? I mean, are consoles gonna be around in 10 years? If even Microsoft is, you're sort of de-emphasizing. Yeah, I equate in my head gaming on console to gaming on a television, mm -hmm. but absolutely people are playing on more screens. And I think for us as a platform, if we don't adopt that as part of our strategy, we're kind of pushing against what our consumer, what our customers are asking for. We talked a bit about kids earlier and you know, as a mom, I'm always slightly terrified that my kids are playing too much, video games are ruining their brains, they're gonna be exposed to all this bad stuff. I know- That's all the positive. <laughs> <laughs> You're very pro game for kids. And I wonder, I wonder how do you support that? As a parent, <laughs> you know what's best for your kid first. Like I'm not gonna say what's best for any individual's kids. What we can say, and the research backs this up, that gaming can be a great on-ramp for kids into STEM education as they think about, well, how are these games built? I also think the community power of gaming is something that doesn't get talked about enough. Last night, I was playing Escape Room on Xbox with one of my friends, and while the conversation might start about how are we gonna escape from this room, then we're talking about his daughter who's looking at colleges, and we just talk about life, like people will when they're in the same place. And I think that ability for gaming, whether it's with kids or adults, to bring people from different backgrounds, different geographies, different socioeconomic, different religion, different genders together in shared experiences is pretty unique out there. And I think building those connections that video games can enable, maybe this is too altruistic, but there aren't enough of those things in the world today. Which brings me to the metaverse. You know, obviously, Sacha came on my show. I hope that this is the next big thing that happens after the mobile internet. Facebook changed its name to Meta. Some gamers don't even want this whole metaverse thing. <laughs> my view on, uh, on metaverse is gamers have been in the metaverse for 30 years. When you're playing games, if you're playing uh, a World of Warcraft game, you're playing in Roblox, you're playing in a racing game where everybody's in a shared world. These 3D shared worlds that gamers have been playing in for years and years, I think what we've found is there's more connection, as I was talking about before, because we have shared purpose. It's not at all surprising to me that gamers might look at Metaverse and think, well, I don't really get it, because we've, we've already, I already have an avatar of myself, mm -hmm. and I can already go into a shared world, and I can already sit there and have voice conversations with people anywhere. But I do think the skills that we have as game designers and game creators make a ton of sense in a lot of enterprise experiences. And this is why Satya gets excited about it. What about crypto? Play to earn is 
all the rage right now. Play to earn specifically is something I'm cautious about. Um, it creates a worker force out of players for certain players to kind of monetize. Now, to be fair for us in the, ga in the game industry, this has existed for years and years. There have been gold farmers of people who literally just spend their time doing some menial task in a game to accrue some currency that then they could sell to some other rich player in for real money so that that person doesn't have to spend their time. But now you find games that are starting to build that into the economy of the game itself. We made some comments in Minecraft about how we view NFTs in this space because we saw people doing things that we thought were exploitive in our product and we said we don't want that. I think sometimes it's, it's hammer looking for a nail when these technologies come up. But the actual human use or player use in our case of these technologies, um, I think there could be some interesting things. So let's talk about your priorities looking forward. You know, you're in the middle of trying to do this really big deal. Are we gonna see you keep doing deals? Are you still on the, the lookout for new studios or new geographic locations where you want to build out Microsoft's gaming presence? Definitely on the second part, ge geographic uh, expansion is critically important. We've hired our first people in Nigeria now as part of our team. We have teams in India, have teams in South America. You know, again, when I talk about three billion gamers, I'll just use Africa for a second, like 1.2 billion people on the continent. Average age is what, 20 or 21. I think it's very, very likely that the next big hit games that we're gonna see are not from the traditional locations, not from the traditional people, and I think that's fantastic. So geographic expansion is critical. Cloud is important to that as we put our data centers in places and we can not only distribute the games but allow creators to use our cloud development platforms to build games without having to have the local hardware right there in their house or in their office to go build. I think that is important. So we're going to do a little rapid fire. Okay. What video games are you playing now? Uh, Cult of the Lamb. Most important meeting you've ever played a game in? You're trying to get me in trouble, but <laughs> games I've... Have you ever just played a game in a meeting with Sacha? <laughs> it's easier on Teams calls because they can't see your screen. You're not in the same room with people. I have played games. Sati has caught me playing games before. Um, and, yeah, I'd say a Satya <laughs> meeting. I, I, I plead the fifth. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not gaming? Of all things, snowboard with my family. You have a lot of gaming fans. Who do you fan over? You know, one of the things I love to go do is find a game I've never heard of and go spend time with it and then talk to the creators about it. I think creating something, putting it out there, is such a brave thing to do. If you could see any band in their prime, who would it be? Wow. So I'm a punk rock fan. Um, so I'd probably go back and say, like, the Ramones. Best piece of advice for your 20s? When I think about at least my career, and that's the only lens I have, mm -hmm. There have been a number of times when others have made bets on me that I probably didn't think I was ready for, including the job I'm in now. And to listen to the others around you when they are making a bet on you, when they're pulling you to go do things, at least for me, who I was probably reticent, maybe a little imposter syndrome kicking in on was I really ready for something. But understand that others around you, when they're encouraging you, that they're probably doing it for good reason. How do you balance work, life, and play. My little 15 minute commute back and forth is my transition zone mm -hmm. of I'm now at work, I'm now at home. I don't even have a home office because mm -hmm. when I'm home, I'm not at work. Like it's just always been my, my thing is that segmentation with my family and what I do. It doesn't mean I've never responded to a mail when I'm at home, um, but I, I'm, I'm very regimented that way. When COVID happened, it didn't work and it didn't work emotionally. It didn't work output wise, like motivation. And I was pretty transparent about that with the people around me and how I had to change things. Does that mean you want everyone else to come back to the office? No, people have to work in the way that works for them. What does the gaming industry look like in five years and what does it look like in 20 years? We're gonna see video games really gain their space in telling stories that really change people's perspective on others' lived experience. And I think that's a, a pretty cool thing. All right, thank you, oh, Phil, thank you. for joining us.